you get thrown up one minute to be set on fire, mm. and then one minute you're being asked to, you know, being shot. And then my first big job came on Braveheart. Oh my God. And to work on GoldenEye, which was amazing. Mm. That to me was like, you know, wow, I'm now a stuntman, I'm on a Bond film. You, you did quite a few Bond films, didn't you? <laughs> I did all of Pierce Brosnan's, um, and then I did two of Daniels. I did Casino Royale and then Quantum of Solace. Mm. What do you do as a stunt coordinator? We had loads of stunts on that, from bikes jumping off the stadium, bike chases, loads of fights, people being shot. Yeah, these are my fingers that were cut off in the film, which, uh, uh, yeah, it was quite a gruesome scene, but it was good fun <laughs> to do. How does it feel like to be set on fire? Then you have a three-quarter bone, which can normally be all of your back, at least, you know, maybe bits of your arms, and a little bit on your legs, with your face still exposed. You have to go down because there's no way, you know, if you breathed in, you'll take the flames straight into your lungs. Mm -hmm. And I had vision because I wasn't wearing a mask, but the thing of just shifting me across because the flames caught me mm -hmm. um, was fine. It's just I didn't realize that where I was going, there was a drop. And you'll see a little, there's like a bit, like a red mark on the actual, mo on the actual tarmac, which is where I then start giving the command for the drivers to start pulling apart. And obviously the difference between it not being right is that if it went slightly more on the line, then obviously where his foot is, the truck would go in, and obviously his leg would go past. Mm. But we managed to get it wow. in the first take. And, you know, he's got to be dodging in and out of these corridors, you know, on a bike at speed. It's not speeded up. We did the first part, and now we're overlapping to do the bit where he obviously loses the back end of it. And I went, you know what, I don't really want to put any people there. Uh, I don't have any other stunt guys, we've seen everyone. Let's just have it blank. And lucky that we did, because as he's taking the bike, the back end's gone, it's gone straight into the wall, which looked great. Mm. But if you would have had someone there, what would you say for people who want to do what you did? What would be the step-by-step -step instruction? My name is Andrei Rogozin, and this is Beyond Real Talk, a podcast where I invite real entertainment industry professionals and ask them real questions. What are they actually doing? How are they doing it? Why are they doing it? And how can you start doing the same thing? And my today's guest is a legend. He's a stunt performer, stunt coordinator, second unit action director. In 2005, he was inducted into the Hollywood Stuntman's Hall of Fame for his contribution to the film and television industry. Three times he was nominated at the World Taurus Stunt Awards in 2004 for 28 Days Later, in 2018 for Hitman's Bodyguard, and in 2019 for Final Score. As a stunt performer, he has been shot countless times, decapitated, thrown from moving cars, run over by moving cars, kicked off a mountain, beaten, blown up, and set on fire many, many times. And his body of work includes films and series like The Witcher, Expendables, The Sandman, Spider-Man Far From Home, Solo, Star Wars Story, The Hitman's Bodyguard, Peaky Blinders, Game of Thrones, Avengers Age of Ultron, 24 Live Another Day, Fast and Furious 6, Charlie, Captain America, The First Avenger, Harry Potter, Pirates of the Caribbean, Bond films, and, and a lot more. Peter, hi. Hello. One more huge thing that you did, and even if you're not into the films, you probably have seen that. Volvo adds the epic split featuring Jean-Claude Van Damme. Uh, it was you as well, right? You correct, yes. that stunt. You know how many stunt, how many credits you have on IMDb? No, I kind of not checked, no. <laughs> uh, only for stunt-related jobs, it 347 finished and 10 upcoming. <laughs> That's a lot. It's a few. Can you tell me, um, how did it all start for you? What did you do anything before you became a stuntman? How did you, how how were you drawn to the world of film? Well, I had two passions when I was growing up as a kid. Mm. One was football, and the other was films. Uh, and football actually came first before, obviously, my transition into films. I was just about to turn professional at the age of sixteen mm. uh, for a club out in Spain, and unfortunately, the night before, I had an accident and I ruptured and tore my ACL, um, and. I remember getting taken to the stadium, the physio came in, medic, and even just walking through the door, he was already nodding his head. So when I explained what had happened, uh, they put me on the on the couch, grabbed my knee, and my knee was just dancing all over the place. And he just said, basically, that's the end of your career. So that was that was my dream gone. Um, so I came back, to the, back, back home, devastated, not knowing what I was going to do. And then a very close friend of mine who I'd grown up with, his uncle had been an extra for many years in films, mm. uh, said, you, you know, you talked about being a stuntman, you know, with, with my nephew, Luke. Um, why don't, why you don't go for that? So 
waited a couple of months until my leg had settled down. I uh, couldn't have any surgery at the time because I had to strengthen it up. Mm. But he suggested that I should um, try and get some extra work. So I contacted, at the time, the FAA, which was the Film Arts Association in the UK. Um, sent them a letter, typed letter. They called me, went down to meet them. And they said, yeah, you know, definitely uh, go to Central Casting in Central London. And they'll explain how it works and get some photos done. And that was the beginning of my mm. entry into films. So, so basically, what, like, it was uh, like background actress agency, right? Yeah, it and was you that, had to go there and make photos and everything for them. Yeah, know? and that's that's the age of, like I said, just turning seventeen. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so back in the old days, obviously mobile phones didn't exist, so everything was done by you know a house phone. You had to ring up every morning or every afternoon, mm. and basically inquire if there was any work, unless they called you. Mm. And my first job that I was picked to do, there was a bar fight, uh, which I was in my element. I was just playing a punter in a bar and I was actually picked by the director to be involved in it, just in a performance point of view. Mm. Um, and that was it. That was, that was definitely my first eye opener being on, on, on anything where I saw stunts being performed live. Um, so that's when I started doing my stunt training at the age of 17. At the age of 17? Yep. Yeah. Uh, how does it feel like at the age of 17 to get on like on a film set, probably like it wasn't a small set. We have to realize back then, obviously, the internet didn't exist and there wasn't many publications, you know, and a way of sort of seeing behind the scenes, apart from the occasional program you might see on television. So for me to be on a film set, you know, from seeing it in magazines and the occasional program that you'd see on television, it was, you know, it was outstanding. Mm. Um, you know, it was throw, f completely thrown back. It was like, wow, you know, and seeing how things were that done as opposed to what you imagined. Mm. And then to see a fight being put together very slowly and understanding, you know, and that, that was 17 at the time. So, you know, for me, it was it was something completely new, even though I loved action. You know, my father used to work in, in the catering business. Um, and when he used to come back home from from work at night, at the time of being five and six, I used to sneak out of bed and go and sit with him on the sofa and hide and watch television film, films or television programs until the early hours of the morning. Uh, and then obviously when my mom, I'd go back to bed and then when I'd had to get up to go to school, obviously I was very tired. <laughs> I wonder but, why. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but my father was a big influence with me and my love of films, you know, from westerns to action films, you know, watching the Bond films together, you know, and it was, I found it then exciting. It was like, wow, this is great, you know, and I was being very active. It was something that, you know, I thought about, but at the time had no inkling of how you could ever even achieve this. Mm. Um, it's not like now where obviously, you know, with the technology that we have, you can be in the remotest part of the world and find out about stunts, where to train. You know, it's evolved immensely from when I first kind of discovered it or thought about it to where we are now. Hmm. How, how long did it take you to get in stunt register? Can you, just in general, can you explain to people who don't know, because obviously I know everything. <laughs> I'm just asking for a friend. Uh, but the, can you explain what is stunt register? How did you get on it? And how different is the process, for example, was back then and now? England is probably one of the only countries um, that has a training system um, to become a stuntman. Other film countries around the world, from the United States to Spain to France to Germany, uh, don't have the system that we have, which is, it's like a degree. It's like a physical degree. Mm. Um, and we have six disciplines. The disciplines, you have fighting, falling, agility, strength, vehicles, uh, water, miscellaneous. And out of those categories, obviously, you under fighting, you could have, obviously, there's a massive list, you know, basically any martial art that's a recognized martial art. Yeah. Or you've got boxing, where boxing you would need, I think it was 20 bouts, uh, professional uh, fights. Mm -hmm. uh, martial arts, it's a, it's a black belt. Um, so any, any martial art that's a recognized martial art um, is a black belt. And then like diving, you'd need a dive master, uh, you know, certificate. So all the, all the skills are professional level, which all that does, that gives you an understanding of those skills. It doesn't teach you to be a stuntman. But obviously, if you're doing falls and you obviously have your trampoline aboard or high diving aboard, you have spatial awareness. So when you're falling from something, you know how to basically where to turn, how to turn, as opposed to just someone that goes, oh, I can do that. Mm. And just, you know, thrown off a building. So all the qualifications that we have hit all aspects of stunt work. You know, so if you do rally driving, obviously, then from, a, you know, from a driving point of view, but you find a lot of our stunt performers who specialize in certain things have a certain professional background. So some of our best bike guys come from a motocross background or, you know, from a performance background, like the Red Bull. So there is, you're saying there are six disciplines, right? And to be a stuntman, do you need to kind of be able to perform in every discipline or there are like some kind of number of disciplines that you have to be 
able to perform in, but you don't have to be uh, professional in all of them. Well, no, the thing is, you can't, yeah, the, the, the actual the qualifications you need, they're all the same standard. So if you think of a black belt, how long it would take you to get that? Mm -hmm. So all the other awards are of the same level. Um, yeah, you can specialize. I mean, you find people that obviously, that people that do motorbikes, you know, who are very good at doing bike stuff, mm -hmm. s seldom do other stunts, even though they do get asked to perform other types of stunts. You always think of certain people when it comes to, if you've got a bike action in your script, you go, oh, I know the person or the group of people that I'd like to use. Mm -hmm. uh, especially when it comes to high falls. You know, everyone can do a fall up to a certain amount of height. But, you know, when you're talking about 20 meters plus, you know, 100 feet plus, there's only a few people because obviously at the end of the day, unless you're rehearsing and practicing, that's quite a bit of a height. Um, so most people are comfortable up to 30, 40 feet, 50 feet. Anything plus to that, you know, needs rehearsal time. Unless you're someone that obviously is someone that's dedicated themselves to do high falls. Was it the same back then? Like, was it the, the, the same, same categories uh, as now, yeah? Yeah, the categories have remained the same. The only thing is that the standard of uh, the qualification was a little bit less. Mm -hmm. You know, people have become fitter, you know, but there's the internet, like I said, at the end of the, back in the old days, you know, there wasn't the amount of information that there is now. And you've always had people that don't work as part of the stunt register. Um, the thing about the stunt register when it was formed is that to do stunts, any company would have to make sure you're insured. And the only way that you could get stunt insurance, at the time there was only one company that was offering it, is you had to be a member of the stunt register. Mm. Um, so no one really back then was ever employing anyone that wasn't a member of, of the stunt register. One, you're insured, and the level of training that comes with it. You know, so at the end of the day, there is a system that we have that's very effective. I mean, it is the best in the world. You know, we have a training system that when you first become a stuntman, you're only allowed to work for three years under the supervision of a stunt coordinator, mm -hmm. which means that you're gaining invaluable experience. So someone will phone you, whatever the job involves, a car knockdown, being set on fire, crashing a car, high speed chase. A coordinator will work it all out. You do the performance. So for three years, you're learning. After three years, even though it's changed now, after three years, if you've had 36 identifiable stunts, which means that you've done stunts that are identifiable, as in, like I said, high fall, set on fire, jumping out of a window, you can apply to the next level. The next level is called intermediate, which means that once you get your intermediate ticket, that means that you can go out and perform stunts for yourself, but not for anyone else. You can't coordinate and you can't have anyone else working for you. Mm -hmm. So if you have an accident, you're only going to hurt yourself. And what that does, that gives you valuable time to learn how to do risk assessments and understand basically the business of doing smaller stunts. Once you've had a further two years of working on your own and reached the amount of stunts that they've asked for, you would then apply to the next level. And the next level being full member. Once you became a full member, that by right meant you had five years minimum of experience where you could now go and coordinate. Doesn't matter if it was obviously starting on a small TV show, small film or a big film, but that's the training that we had, five years. Now it's changed. We still have the same system, but there's other tiers in between, which all it is is just basically to make sure that when you do go and coordinate that you're safe, mm -hmm. you know, and even though we do a job of a hazardous nature, hence it's stunts, the main thing is that everything's worked out, about risk assessments, you know how to put stuff together, and you know how to involve all the other departments, because you've got special effects, got costume, there's loads of aspects that work alongside stunts that have to work in conjunction to make the stunt safe. Mm -hmm. But again, it is a stunt. So if you're going to get hit by a car, at the end of the day, even though you're padded and there's ways of rolling onto the bonnet and coming off, you are coming off a car onto concrete onto a road, mm -hmm. you know, so... At the end of the day, pads and no pads, you know, after a time, you know, you do feel it. You know, it's unfortunate. That's, that's why it's used as stuntman, because at the end of the day, if we get injured, how horrible it sounds, you can bring in another stunt double mm -hmm. or a stunt performer. But if the actor gets hurt, then your shoot closes down. So that's the whole aspect of, of having a stuntman is basically for scenes that are risky and that obviously you have someone that's trained. Of course. Yeah. And so if there are, for, for example, like the stunt performers who actually do the actual stunts, they do have some kind of specializations because if, like for driving scene, you will go to one stunt, for falling to another. Uh, for stunt coordinators, do the, is there like also kind of specialization or if you're a stunt coordinator, you can set up any kind of trick? Most performers generally should be able to do most of the stuff that they've trained for. So obviously driving, fighting, falls, being set on fire, car knockdowns, getting thrown off something, through something or onto something. When you're then talking about specific stuff where you're talking about someone jumping a bike over cars, uh, over ditches, you know, high falls, you know, specific horse action, then yeah, you go for the people that obviously that's their speciality, even though they do other stuff. But in general, most stuntmen are kind of like jack of all trades, you know, 
you get phoned up one minute to be set on fire, mm -hmm. and then one minute you'll be asked to, you know, be shot. So really, at the end of the day, two different stunts. Mm -hmm. um, but it's only when it becomes very technical stuff that you obviously go for the people who obviously that's their forte. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, you started training for stunts. How long did it take you to to become like a, a certified stuntman? So I started, as I said, at the age of seventeen um, in films. And then probably about within the next six months, once my leg had kind of stabilized, um, I then started doing my training. The, the only qualification I had prior to all that is I'd been doing martial arts since I was a kid. Hmm. So I already had my martial arts way out the way. What did you do? I did Wushu Kwan Chinese boxing, oh. which I did for many years. Um, and then I started the other qualifications. Um, I, I was into horse riding. I loved horses. But obviously living in central London, obviously, you know, um, I didn't grow up with horses. But um, trampolining, scuba diving, swimming... And fencing, fencing was one of the qualifications. And I started doing my training, but then the phone would ring. Peter, are you available to work as a background artist on, let's say, Batman, the Tim Burton one, or Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves? So, of course, you're going to work on those, but then your stunt training would be affected because if you're working, especially back then, you know, um, on a job for six weeks, seven weeks, two months, by the time you've gone back to carry on doing your training, Obviously, you know, you're kind of not forgotten, but, you know, you've got to start again, really. Yeah. Um, and the hours that you do, as you know, you obviously you can't then go and train in the evening because most of the classes that we're doing were during the daytime. Mm -hmm. And then when you had the weekend, you know, it was time to relax. So gradually it took me until the age of 24. I was accepted at the age of 24. Um, and I made the conscious decision at 23 thinking that if I didn't stop doing crowd work and, you know, um, that I was never going to finish <laughs> until I was 30. Mm -hmm. Um, so I had money saved up, stopped doing uh, film work, which, you know, I really didn't want to do, but I loved it. Took the occasional job if it was one or two days mm. um, and then did my training. And then I qualified, I was accepted uh, in March 94. Uh, and basically, as soon as you get accepted, how, how quickly do you start getting jobs? In my career, or my, my training up to becoming, to be actually put my stuff forward, to be, to be, hopefully to be accepted, I'd already met probably most of the stunt coordinators in the industry in my time being a background artist. Because mm. uh, at some point, obviously, I'd met them on Robin Hood or Batman or other TV jobs. And I always used to approach them, you know, when we were told, sort, you know, we don't need you for the moment. I'd kind of sneak out and say, well, do you mind if I watch what you're doing? Because I'm mm. trying to be, to hopefully, to get onto the stunt register. So when I first got on, um, I was quite fortunate. I was working within a couple of days after being accepted. I did a couple of TV jobs for two, two stunt coordinators who I'd known for, for a long time. And then my first big job came on Braveheart. Oh my God. I, I, I wanted you to bring this up because <laughs> here is my history with Braveheart. Uh, I remember I was still a kid. I don't remember what, uh, how, how old I was, but I remember my brother comes back home one day and he brings it this VHS cassette, like video cassette. He says like, this is the film you have to see. And then he shows it to me. And I was just in shock. I was crying like like a little baby every time I was watching the freedom moment and all this stuff. But this is kind of, this is one of my most favorite films. And if someone would tell me back then that I would be sitting here and talking to someone who worked on that film, can you tell me about Braveheart? What was it? How was it? Uh, how, like, what did you do on it? And just in general, what was your experience with it? Well, I remember, get, I remember getting the phone call. Uh, I, um, I remember getting the phone call and kind of put the phone down after I was asked if I was available for seven weeks to go out to Dublin. I remember kind of like just going, yes! Running around the house really, really happy. Um, so I spent seven weeks in Dublin working for Simon Crane, who was the stunt coordinator. Mm. Uh, and it was great. I got to play a Scotsman and obviously a British soldier. Um, and it was amazing. We did the battles of Falkirk and Stirling, um, loads of fighting with the cast, um, backwards and forwards, you know, with the stuff with the arrows. There's a massive scene it where... Uh, all these arrows get fired and we're all doing moonies. Mm. Uh, you know, and you know, it was, I think, the biggest scene ever in the world where someone had exposed their ass mm. on camera. Yeah. It was a whole, <laughs> whole group of people. Um, but yeah, it was, it was amazing. It was um, a great experience. And obviously, you know, I'd grown up with, obviously, with Mel Gibson, you know, as far as watching these films. And it's like, again, that was my first interaction really as opposed to being a background artist where you're not really, you know, you're there just to yeah, you know, yeah. add background. So all of a sudden, kind of been on first, not first name terms, but you know, kind of been introduced and oh, this is Peter and you're going to do this. And it was great. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a great film to work on, you know. How hard was it? I won't say it was hard. It's just, it was fun. Mm -hmm. A great group of people, um, you know, 
apart from the British stunt team, we had some Irish stunt performers out there. We had the horse team, a lot of horsemen that came out from Spain and became longtime friends. But it was great. It was just, it was amazing to be in that mix. And it's funny because one of the assistant directors who I'd known for years, being a background artist, I met him on that, now being a stuntman. So it was completely different. So from being an extra, hmm. and all of a sudden now being on that job and now being a stuntman, it's different. You know, it's, it was, it was nice. It was, you know, I'd, I'd kind of gone from here to here, which mm -hmm. was great. Um, and it was nice. It was a great adventure. Nice. Yeah. Because I, but, but at the same time, like, I can't imagine because I, I'm assuming it's like very long hours. It's all kind of shot outside. It's probably cold, a lot of rain. Uh, but it's still, uh, every time when I kind of think about this, that film, it's one of my most favorite films. Uh, so. Weather, I have to be honest, I mean, my, my recollection and from the photos, you know, you look back, you go, no, we had great weather. Where it was really cold and it was raining and muddy was when they shot in Scotland, uh, in Fort William. Uh, but when they moved the location to Ireland, it was great. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't recall actually ever having a day, I think, where we had really bad weather. But it was great. You know, and in between takes, we'd sit down, chat, have a cup of tea. And then back to work, but it was it was it was a great experience. Mm. Uh, how how often did like did you get work after that? Well, after I remember coming, it was the seventeenth of July. I forget that seventeenth July that I went out. It was for seven weeks, and then came back. I had some TV jobs, just a couple of days, uh, which was great. And then I got the phone call, which for me was at the time I would say bucket list. It was the it was the one that I think any stuntman dreams of. Mm. Was getting a phone call for the Bond film for mm -hmm. Goldeneye, the first film shot since License to Kill, New Bond, which was um, Pierce Brosnan, Brosnan yeah. um, and to work on Goldeneye, which was amazing. Mm. That to me was like, you know, wow, I'm now a stuntman, I'm on a Bond film. Mm. And uh, you, you did quite a few Bond films, didn't you? <laughs> I did seven in total. I did all of Pierce Brosnan's, um, and then I did two of Daniels. I did Casino Royale and Quantum of Solace. Mm. Uh, any like favorites yeah i mean they're all good i mean obviously goldeneye was great because it was the first one mm -hmm. and i remember martin campbell the director uh i was the first person killed on camera even though they'd already been shooting i was the first person killed on camera um in the shoot mm -hmm. uh, which was quite funny um and i remember just about to do the rehearsal and um there was a bit of pressure on it was done in a very, very light-hearted way. Mm. So I kind of went above and beyond on the rehearsal. And then the director, no, 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 save it for the day. <laughs> um, and yeah, it was great. It was, it was nice. I, I, I had a bit of work on it. And it was really enjoyable just to be on a Bond film. I mean, that was, you know, mm. that was my dream come true. I mean, you know, I think any kid, you know, growing up wants to be in a Bond film. You know, it's, uh, especially yeah. if you're a stuntman. It's, I think so, you know, yeah. And playing, playing a baddie, or you know, playing, you know, which is it's the most fun jobs. Are there any projects that you remember that like are kind of like ingrained in your memory for some reason, or like any fun stories from the sets? Yeah, I mean, I kind of missed Indiana Jones. Didn't get to work on that, but obviously, mm. as a kid, you know, an adventure story. So I got to do the Mummy films, mm -hmm. uh, which for me was kind of like the equivalent, uh, and that was amazing. That was great fun to do, you know. Which I, I think to me probably one of my fondest films to have worked on uh, was Mummy One and Two. Mm -hmm. Um, having double in Omidajili, the comedian, uh, as the warden, where I run into the wall after he's got the scarab that goes up his uh, his neck uh, into his head, and he kind of goes running rah, and into a wall, which is a gag called a dead man. But that was great. I mean, that was you know, it, it's, there's nothing better if you're lucky enough to perform a gag that's for a principal actor that's going to be kind of you know that's going to be immortalised. Let's say mm. you know where people have a reaction. You know, we I remember going to see it at the cinema. Mm. You know, and obviously I'd already seen the film. I'd gone to see it again with my folks. And just waiting for that moment to see how people would react, and it's great. How long did it take you um, uh, to basically become a stunt coordinator? For me, I wasn't really in a hurry to become a stunt coordinator. I became a stuntman to do stunts. I, I love, I love being in front of a camera. You know, it's, it's. I love the aspect of you know all the different characters. One minute you could be sword fighting, mm. then you could be playing a bad guy with a machine gun, or getting hit by a car, or just basic stuff. You know, even just safety. Um, but it took me nearly 10 years. I wasn't really in a hurry. Mm. Um, I was very happy just performing. I'd been assisting, which is the kind of progression that you have. If you work with a coordinator that trusts you, then, you know, he'll let you run part of the floor or maybe go and run another little unit outside of the main unit, but just to get experience. Mm. Um, you know, but obviously he has to trust you. And then from there, it was like, you know what? I think 10 years as a performer. And then gradually, you know, I'd already had my full membership, but I chose not to go out as a coordinator. I was still very happy performing. Mm. And, it's it's only when I think my, one of my first jobs is that the coordinator that had been asked to do it wasn't available. So he said, I know someone that could cover it for you. 
someone that's worked for me for quite a while. So he put me up for it. I got the job. And then that's really my first foray into stunt coordinating. Mm. And what's what's the difference between like so so just what do you do as a stunt coordinator? Very different. I mean, obviously, as the coordinator, it's your responsibility is basically to read the script, to understand all the action, what is needed, and then to facilitate that for the director, put his vision on the screen. You know, as a performer, you know, you get phoned up, Peter, you're available for three weeks, yeah, you're playing this, you turn up, you rehearse, do your stuff and you go home. As the coordinator, you're a boss. You know, so basically you're in charge of basically working out all the stunts. Explain to the director how we're going to do it, if that's what he wants, getting the right people for the, you know, the team. And then basically, you could say you're, you're directing the stunts. You're the one that's in charge. So everything obviously falls under your responsibility, which is basically saying what can be done and what can't be done. You get a script. Yep. And there is a fight scene. As a stunt coordinator, what do you prefer to get? Like, uh, and what do you usually get? Do writers who usually don't know how to fight <laughs> actually write the fights? <laughs> <laughs> and then you have to kind of redo all of it or kind of find a way to make it work, even though you understand, like, whoever wrote it doesn't know how to fight. Does it happen? Okay, so when you get a script and someone's written, let's say, a fight sequence, mm -hmm. if it's something that's very basic, normally it's, as far as descriptive, it's a domestic fight or something that someone's got an idea with something specific. But then you look at it and you kind of go, not that that won't work, this might be better within that circumstance. Or sometimes the script will just say, fight sequence. Mm -hmm where obviously there's certain points that might have to be hit where the person ends up getting thrown out of a window or it's been written and the guy gets hit with an iron, mm -hmm. okay? But then the rest of it really is down to you. But if it's written already descriptively, when you read it, you could, you know, you're reading, you're kind of, you, you know, you're, you're kind of acting it out in your head and you're going, okay, that's fine. This would be better. That seems a little bit too long. Or that, you wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. And then obviously it's for you to show the director what your idea is, you know, mm -hmm. either in a, in a rehearsal or just to have a discussion, mm. and then either go with it or go, no, I like what's written. So really, at the end of the day, that's where you are. But normally, with any stunt coordinator, either they go along with what's written, yeah. or they'll go, you know what, we can actually make this a bit more fun, mm. or you know, much more in keeping what the storyline is. Mm. But but well, like, what do you prefer? Do you prefer for a writer to try to kind of write down the, the sequence as they see it, and then to work on it yourself, or just to have like this this very brief like there's a fight scene, there are like two characters, this one fights more dirty, this one is more skillful, blah blah blah. To be honest, yeah, I, I, I go for the later. It's, it's, it, to be creative is, is, the, is, the, is the ideal thing. And obviously, some things are very simple, which mm -hmm. you don't have to complicate. So if it's something that's very simple, it is what it is. But if it's an elongated fight where something is written where you go, you go, you know what, this has been done quite a few times on a film. No, it's not original. It's just, it's just it's been done before. Mm -hmm. Why don't we take it from this angle? Um, you know, and it's always not so much of a shock factor, but when you think where action is where we are now with action, so much content's been made. It's like, how do you try and make something slightly different? It's quite, not impossible, but you know, within a fight or gun action, it becomes quite repetitive. So it's adding your own little kind of, you know, flavor to it. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe adding a prop or something that wasn't written in there that makes it slightly different. Mm -hmm. But if you think how many action films come out, you know, every year, and at the end of the day, it's like, you know, a fight to fight, but it's how can you make it entertaining for the audience, yeah. you know? And for the character that's involved, does the character, would he do this? Mm -hmm. Has he got the specialist trained to be able to do that? Or is this just happened because it's out of luck that something happens to be lying next to him, that he's hit him across the head with it? Mm -hmm. um, so really, if you can be creative, for me, obviously, that's the major enjoyment is to actually have, you know, to think about stuff. Well, one thing is just to do fights, but then... Did you work, well, I know that you did, but maybe you can tell me maybe more like some interesting tricks that you had to actually create like a project, I don't know, build something for so, some some stunts, I don't know, some kind of like any creative d d solutions that you had to make to, to create some very, very complex stunt tricks. I've been, I've been very fortunate. Most of the stuff that I've done, well, I'd say most of it is, is basically it, it's, it's been worked out. There's been occasions where I've read the action, I've gone, well, this doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't make sense because obviously I think the person that's written it even didn't drive a car or physically didn't understand that if you break a window uh, in, a, in a windscreen that you're not going to get massive shards of glass. Mm -hmm. So you'll go, well, that, he's, he's not going to be able to stab someone with a, with a piece of little glass like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, because that's how glass is. It's not like the old-fashioned glass in, in windows or in a painting where you might get, you know, a, a massive shard. Um, so there you'll have to, you're, there you'll change the action accordingly because it's impossible. It just wouldn't make sense. That's just, mm. that's just a mistake. Um, you know, someone's not, not understanding of obviously what would happen when you land on, on a car windscreen. Um, but the rest of it really at the end of the day, it's just, it's just coming out with ideas. Mm. Um, you know, unless you've 
you're working from the very beginning with someone where someone's got an initial idea for a film where you might have done a concept film and you go, right, let me design everything. Mm -hmm. But mostly when you get on a project, everything's kind of already been thought out. Mm. The, the, the thing is, with any stunt, at the end of the day, obviously, what equipment you're going to use, you know, if you're having someone being ratcheted back, you know, if you're putting someone where they've been shot with a shotgun, obviously, you know, unless they're doing their own physical action where they're throwing themselves back, normally we have an attachment onto a harness mm -hmm. where basically, you know, it's it's put onto a pulley system and a, and a nitrogen cylinder where, where you fire it, it pulls the person back mm -hmm. a certain height. So, yeah, working out where you're going to put, you know, your pulleys and stuff and what's going to get seen and... Yeah, that's that's the parts that you work out. You know, if someone's going to get set on fire, you're throwing someone out of a window, and they're going to land on something. Obviously, what's the safety uh, measures you're taking for them to land on? Is it going to catch fire? How do you get to them? But that's that's just a procedure of a stunt coordinator working out the dynamics of the action, and then obviously how to work around you know mm. the safety side. You know, if you're throwing someone from a window that's on fire, unless they're going to go into water where the water naturally would put them out, you would still need a dive team in the water your safety team, but if they're diving onto boxes or they're diving onto something where obviously they're elevated off the ground, how do you get to them, obviously, once they're on fire? Because as soon as they hit that box, you have to put them out. So those are the things that you have to work out. It's the, Those are the parameters that you go, how do we incorporate this in the shoot, obviously, from a safety point of view, and then, you know, work, work backwards from that. How long does it usually take you? For example, let's let's say like an average, I know there are not such a thing as average, but average action film. How long does it usually take for you to kind of go through the script and get prepared? And what do you actually usually do, like, to prepare for 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 the sh for the filming? With, with most films, I mean, it depends. Obviously, the the budgets. I mean, it's all about how long you got to shoot. You know, sometimes um, you'll get a schedule. And you go, this is impossible. You know, because unfortunately, however many hours you do on a set, you're not shooting normally for ten hours direct. You know, <laughs> between makeup and everything else, you know, you're not shooting ten hours, even if you're doing a twelve hour day. Um, so some things are possible when you're doing complex stuff which involves maybe prosthetics special effects those are the other two departments obviously so anything that's got special effects prosthetics and stunts can be a headache not because it's just because you are talking about makeup coming off and you've got to glue it and you know uh, effects you have to set it up and make sure it's all safe so all those things add to the shooting of the day um But I mean, an example, I did a, an action film called Final Score. Where we, which we actually we met. met. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, which is kind of like the English version of Die Hard. You know, it's an unsuspecting hero, stumbles across a terrorist plan, you know, where a building, a stadium in this case, um, is under lockdown. You know, the people that are watching the game run aware that, you know, basically there's explosives all around and the hero has to basically save the day. Mm -hmm. um, we had loads of stunts on that from bikes jumping off the stadium, bike chases, loads of fights, people being shot um i remember one of the sound that it was like well, i don't remember who it was i think it was you mate did you do you perform some stuff i did i when i read was this was it like on the banner like the, the, the there was no one, that was no no it wasn't you no no that yeah. was the that was the hero that yeah. was a that was david batista but that was his stunt double yeah, uh, rob yeah. the groot who was who basically does the pirate swing on the banner mm -hmm. now i i kind of gave myself a little role as anton mm -hmm. uh one of the terrorists and again at the time when we were talking about this fight in this kitchen. It was actually quite a small fight, but I had the idea that we could put a fire job in there, mm -hmm. which would make it actually quite exciting. So he's fighting in the kitchen. Um, basically, he gets shot, he's wearing a bulletproof vest, uh, knocks his gun, which is David Batista's guns, basically runs out of rounds. I don't then obviously go for my gun, I pull out a, a big commando knife, and we have a little fight in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. But in the process, I cut one of the pipes that has the gas that goes to the cooker, and obviously the gas is like, you know, coming out. Uh, we end up in a clinch and he cuts off my fingers, which obviously, you know, massive agony, mm -hmm. pushes me to the ground. I stumble, get covered in oil. I then go and pick up my shotgun, pick it up. And as I go to fire, obviously there's a gas cloud in front of me, which ignites, sets me on fire. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was appropriate that we can have a big set piece there with the person on fire, which um, worked really well. Mm -hmm. Worked really, really well. Um And then obviously the second part of the fight is obviously with Martin Ford, which is obviously, you know, this other fight in the kitchen where he dunks his head into a, into a fryer of chips. Uh, um, but yeah, but again, we didn't have a three month sh shoot. I think mm. we shot for just under seven weeks, mm. um, which for what we did, but I had a great team. Um, we knew what we wanted. Um, and, you know, it, it, we, we didn't have any injuries, um, you know, and there was lots of stuff. We had, uh, like I said, a motorbike jumping off a stadium. Um, which we did on wires, it was impossible to do it for real how it was, 
Um, and then obviously you look now, and obviously Tom Cruise has just done that on his Mission Impossible. He's done it for real. Mm. Uh, but you know, but then obviously you know, Tom Cruise's film was a bit bigger. <laughs> a, bigger a little bit bigger, version. yeah, a little bit a bigger, little bit. a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. I think uh, his catering budget was probably the yeah, was <laughs> just yeah, was bigger than ours. <laughs> but no, but that's that's the, it. Shows you the extent. I mean, obviously at the end of the day, to me, it's one of my fondest memories mm. working that film. It was it was great. It mm. was. It's an action film. It's a popcorn film. You know, you go there to watch to watch basically a goodie. It's Die Hard, but mm -hmm. it's Die Hard in a football stadium. It was my first big project where I was was involved. I mean, like I was more 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 like a background uh, actor there. I, one, well, one I remember the, we had you on the roof shooting a machine gun. One of the Russian goons. Yeah, I had throwing out the helicopter. I, I think I, yeah, I think I think we had with like M sixteen. Well, basically the, the assault rifles. Yeah, with three of us. Um, and we're shooting the helicopter. Yeah, <laughs> I remember that one. Which we didn't have a helicopter. We, had, we were firing at a tower. Yeah. And, then, and then we had the helicopter on a crane somewhere else. But um, yeah. but it was great. I mean, yeah. magic of movies. Yeah, yeah. It, it was fun. It was fun. And it was on the roof of the old West Ham Stadium. That's right? correct. That was that's also like there was a big explosion one. <laughs> one well, <night>. that's, <laughs> we, shot, we shot the film there. And it was written around the fact that the stadium was going to be knocked down. Mm. So they contacted... One of the producers, who was one of the friends of the directors of, uh, of West Ham, um, and said, "Look, we're going to knock down the stadium. If you want to shoot here, we're mm. going to knock it down. So, if you want to write an action film, mm. so the film was specifically written around the fact that we had access to a stadium mm -hmm. um, that we could do whatever we wanted to because it was going to get knocked down. And ironically, we actually lived in the stadium mm -hmm. for the entirety of the prep and the shoot, um, which was amazing. I mean, you know, the, to be actually working and living." at your location where I opened up my windows because mm -hmm. it was like the, the private boxes and basically there's the pitch. So these bo these rooms were done obviously for VIPs, yeah. but that's where we were living. So we'd finish shooting and you know, I'd go to my room mm. and then we had barbecues there. It was, it was great. It was a great adventure. It was like being on a cruise ship yeah. in that sense. Yeah, no. uh, so that means I didn't have to travel home because we were doing a lot of night shoots. Mm -hmm. um, so it was great to actually be there, mm. you know, and then literally wake up go and have your breakfast, do a bit of prep, go to the office. And then it was amazing. It was, like I said, one of my most memorable shoots. Yeah, it was fun. Even for us, it was fun. Even though, like, we kind of we, we spent a lot of time in a green room, like the Russian goons. Yes, of course. <laughs> uh, but it, it, it was a fun shoot. Like, and I actually met quite a few people there uh, who are still in code. Like, for you, <laughs> you're yes. here. And uh, Andre, uh, who you know, Andre Nova, who is like, he is kind of training for stunt, uh, I think maybe he's even finishing it now uh, for like stunt register. He's also an actor. And we, since then, we, we, we did probably three, three projects together. I yep. think, <laughs> and we kept in touch. So yeah, yeah. But one thing I still have, which obviously, yeah. I still have my fingers. <laughs> yeah, these are my fingers that were cut off in the film. Which, uh, yeah, it was quite a gruesome scene, but it was good fun to do. <laughs> yeah, my friend Dan Martin, a uh, prosthetic makeup designer extraordinaire who, who cast my hand. I mean, originally I was going to get shot in the ear. Mm. Um, and my ear blew off, but unfortunately we ran out of time. Mm. So we kind of condensated and had me get shot in the chest instead of my ear getting shot off. Um, but it was a great sequence to do. You know, it's, it's a lot of fun when you're fighting someone like, you know, an actor like David Batista, mm. you know, who's amazing, who you obviously know. Um, and even though it's a very short fight that I did with him, um, it was quite an intense fight. It was quite. It was actually quite shortened. There was other bits that we did, mm. but it worked really well for the final film. You know, but I'm, pre I'm pretty sure it's much easier for you to design fights for actors like De Batista, who has like a huge background mm -hmm. in wrestling, right? Because he's an athlete. He knows how to basically to sell a punch, how to fall, and everything. Any other actors that you work with, uh, except De Batista, easy to work with and set fights for them? Well, I think the one that comes to mind that I've worked with quite a few times is Jason Statham. Um, so really, at the end of the day, I mean, there's not really much you, you know you can't teach him, and at the end mm -hmm. of the day, he understands it. And he know he knows he knows how to perform. Mm -hmm. So really, at the end of the day, your half ninety percent of your work is done mm -hmm. because the rest of it, the ten percent, really is having your stunt performance, making sure that they obviously perform as good as he can actually deliver. You know, so where Jason's throwing his punches and any kind of choreography, that your guys are obviously doing the right reactions. But he's he's amazing. You know, he's uh, mm. you know he's a great action actor. Yeah. Uh, on which films did you work with him? On? I did The Bank Job, I did Blitz, and then I did Expendables 4. Mm. How was Expendables 4? That was great fun. I mean, that's a bucket list one for me. I mean, to, to, you know, to coordinate, I mean, being on it as a performer would be amazing, you mm -hmm. know, but to kind of be in charge of an, a part of the film, which was the, sh the parts that were shot in the UK, I did, uh, apart from some safety bits, which, you know, was just standard safety stuff with the actors, I did the bar fight mm -hmm. at the very beginning of the film, and then I did the fight with the podcast guy that he beats up at the swimming pool. 
uh, which was great fun. Um, there was a much bigger fight originally planned, but it was narrowed down. And against Stallone, obviously, you know, who is his, you know, he, he understands physicality probably more than anyone else. Um, we fine tuned it into basically a very, very not quick, but it, it, it done exactly what it said. You know, it's a very simple fight. Uh, but just showing Jason at the end of the day with a set of knuckle dusters, just basically tearing through a bunch of guys in a, mm. in a bikers club. Um, and it came out really well. I mean, I'm really, really happy with the results. Mm. Um, and then we had Eddie Hall, uh, who plays one of the characters, you know, in the film, who, you know, is a big lad and very strong. And originally we had a sequence where he's running towards Stallone and Stallone shoots a bike that's hanging up on the ceiling like a bike and it kind of hits him, knocks him flying. But we changed that last minute. Um, Stallone wanted something a little bit different. So we came out with the idea that he comes running at him towards where Stallone's standing at the bar and he flips him over and it crashes on a load of, uh, like load of tables and glasses. Mm -hmm. So we only had one day to prep this. Um, so we did a rehearsal. And it worked out perfectly, and that's what we shot in the film. So in the mm. film, that's the two things that you see, which is the, the bar fight, and then Eddie Hall running towards Stallone, where he gets flipped over the bar. Mm. Um, and it was great. It was it was amazing. It mm. was you know, very very happy. Big grin, <laughs> you know. No, I, I can imagine because I, I know for, for me growing up and you know in ex-Soviet country in Latvia, uh, Stallone was one of the main action guys. Was well, Stallone, uh, Schwarzenegger, uh, Van Damme. Yep. And I think that's, they were like the main trio. Like, the, of course, there were like other, other guys, but like they were the main action guys for us. <laughs> that would be amazing to, to work on, so, on something like that. Oh, well, maybe, maybe one day, maybe I still, still have some time. Absolutely. Listen, <laughs> like, to be honest, it's like, you know, looking at it from the other side, and I can understand that, you know, for being a kid, or even for the, you know, someone who loves films, to, to see someone that, you know, that you recognize walking down the street, you know, or, mm -hmm. you know, but to actually be, working with them where you know you're on first name terms and mm -hmm. you're working for a project that you know that someone else is going to see at some point and think exactly the same mm -hmm. so you know it's it's i'm very blessed i'm very lucky in, in what i do mm -hmm. um it's 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 the most fun you know yeah. and to take something like you know any kind of action and mold it and then you know you're kind of responsible you know for what it look you know for this piece of work it's 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 a great feeling mm -hmm. uh anyways um how does it feel like to be set on fire? Um, yeah, weird question. How does it be set? Uh, I, no, I, I mean, like, how does it work? What do you do for people to actually not being burned? Like, what, what, can you explain the trick to me? <laughs> well, no, I, I don't know. I've always had a fascination. It's like with fireworks. You know, people like fireworks. It's like amazing. But to me, to see, you know, it's from a stunt point of view, to see someone engulfed in flames. I mean, you know, it's, it's out of all the stunts that you can do, it is, you know, it's like having, doing a high fall. You know, you do a fall where you're watching, you're going, oh, look at that height of that, or getting through it, or getting hit by a car. But with a burn, you know, to sort of think, you know, that's, how, how have they done that? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a very clever process, which has obviously been pioneered over the years to where we are now. Um, but my first foray into fire stunts was doing the fire safety on Braveheart. Mm -hmm for a couple of the performers, which was amazing to watch. And from that day there, it was like, I want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd been on a lots of jobs where I was doing fire safety, um, again, which was amazing. You know, like I said, the process is, um, it's, been de it's been developed over the years of obviously, you know, where what they used to have back in the old days to where we are now with obviously all these safety gels and fireproof clothing, you know, and silicon masks. But the process is um, that you have, uh, Formula Racing underwear, which looks like basically a set of pajamas. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's either Nomex or Carbon X, and you soak it in a gel, which looks like wallpaper glue. Mm -hmm. It's very cold. It's the gel that you have in hospitals for burns. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a coolant gel, and that's saturated in that. And basically, you put on either three layers, depending on what your process. There's obviously there's different processes now, but the standard process used to be they used to put on one wet, one dry, one wet and then your fire suit on top. And your fire suit is made up of, of the same material, but it's three layers. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like a fire, it's a fire suit, a Formula Racing fire suit. Um, and then you put your costume on, and then you put gel on your face. And the gel, like I said, is the coolant gel that you have for burns. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a coolant. It's not water it's in itself. It's a gel. So it just remains on your face until it evaporates cold. Um, and then obviously you use an accelerant, which normally is glue. Mm -hmm. You put glue, obviously in certain areas, you then put either um, alcohol to give it a bit of a, yeah, and then you obviously have you're going to get lit, Molotov cocktail, mm -hmm. flamethrower, whatever it is, and obviously whew, you go up. So there's, there's three types of 
body burns that I would describe. You've got a partial burn, a three-quarter burn, and a full body burn. Mm -hmm. Partial burn can be your arms, maybe mm -hmm. the bottom of your legs, which is fine. You know, don't have that much protection on your face. Then you have a three-quarter burn, which can normally be all of your back, at least, you know, maybe bits of your arms, and a little bit on your legs, with your face still exposed, which means that your performance is, you know, you're still performing, mm -hmm. but you have the gel on. When you do a full body burn, you wear a prosthetic mask, which is a mask that's been made to look like the actor, or it's your features, because once you're completely alight, you can't really tell. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, you do that with a breath hold. So the mask has been designed, it's got Pyrex lenses, which obviously are fireproof, um, and inside the mask, it's like a DV, like where you go diving, but it's just a, a silicon tube that sits on your mouth, you breathe normally through it, and then when you before you get set on fire, you do your breath hold, and then literally, you're performing holding your breath. Then you have a signal to say that obviously you want to be put out or that obviously you know, you're feeling the heat go through, which is whatever, whatever signal you decide, it's either go onto your hands and knees with your arms spread or your hands in front. Whatever you've decided that you've rehearsed, mm -hmm. that's the signal for your team because you can't ask for help mm -hmm. because you can't. It's impossible. So it's not even about screaming. No one knows if you're actually performing. Mm -hmm. So you have a, a visual signal. There is no verbal signal. Mm -hmm. And then obviously you put the person out, obviously make sure that you, know, you take off their mask and if they have any hot spots because normally what happens when you get put out the heat carries on penetrating through the costume. Mm. So it's not that you're going to get burnt as in a live flame, but it's a heat transference, mm. which obviously can give you, it's like a steam burn. Mm -hmm. So obviously CO2 doesn't normally put that out, that just takes off what's on the top. So either you get a wet towel or just douse them with a bucket of water, but normally, you know, a wet towel and then the water just goes through the fibers and you're cool. Um, and then obviously, you know, you take them off, check them out, throw your, you know, burnt costume away so it doesn't, you know, so it's not, you know, hazardous. Mm. And then go and have your shower and relax. What happens if you breathe in, or it's impossible to breathe in? Completely? No, no, that's the thing. It is, it is possible, and obviously you'd burn your lungs. So a full body burn is something that obviously you have to be very comfortable with. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I, you know, if I said to you, let's say for instance, run around this room pretending you're on fire, exhale. Ah, yeah, that's fine. That's performance. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if the if the flame catches, you can maybe turn. You know, you've got gel. Mm -hmm. Now do the same thing, holding your breath, where you got to run, bun, bouncing the stuff. One, your performance is going to be a little bit different because mm -hmm. you're tense. But at whatever point you decide, you have to know that you can't start breathing in while you're standing up on fire. The minute you hit the floor, if you've been covered up to glue for about here, which is normally where you go up to the breast line, mm -hmm. the minute you hit the floor, that already gets put out. So in theory, you can take a cheeky breath because by right, the, the floor mm -hmm. is against your face. So you could go, yeah, a little mm -hmm. bit of a breath. But you know that the minute if you're panicking and you're thinking, or, you know, I can't, the heat's going mm -hmm. through my costume, or for whatever reason, I can't hold any longer. The minute you go down, your fire safety puts you out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, obviously, what you can't do is obviously breathe once they're putting you out with CO2, because if the CO2 goes down, because it acts obviously cutting oxygen, <gasps> you'll obviously, you know, you'll start, you know, basically yeah. not being able to breathe. Um, but normally before you do a full body burn, you've done various partial burns. Mm -hmm. And you've probably rehearsed with a mask. Mm. Um, but yeah, you definitely do not breathe in when you're, when you're completely engulfed in flames. Um, you know, if you've would have got set up and for some reason you lost concentration, you have to go down because there's no way, you know, if you breathed in, you'll take the flames straight into your lungs. Mm. How long do you usually need to kind of like, it's, it's, it's not like 10 or 20 or 30 seconds. Like it's probably minutes of No, the most, the most, I mean, I can only speak for myself. The most that I've been set on fire when I've performed, there's a minute. I mean, a mm -hmm. minute with three cameras or whatever is a long time on fire. Yeah. Um, if anyone goes over a minute long, it's either a, a live show or some kind of world record. But really on camera, a minute of someone on fire is a long time. If you think 60 seconds, mm -hmm. you know, a fight sequence, you know, but a minute of fire. Now, if you're doing a film where you've got zombies or something, where you've got people being chased on fire, then it's multiple takes, mm -hmm. you know, multiple setups. But a person, an individual on fire, normally... 40 seconds is kind of about minimum, mm -hmm. you know, unless obviously the idea is that someone gets engulfed in flames and they're straight on him trying to put him out. Mm -hmm. But that depends on the actual sequence itself. But of all the burns that I've done, being set with a flamethrower, Molotov cocktail, um, it's normally probably up to about a minute. Mm -hmm. That's max. And not apart from that, you're, one either your costume is now this, you know, it's kind of falling apart or the glue and the accelerant uh, that you put on top is now burnt away. Mm -hmm. So, but really about a minute's max. Mm -hmm. Which is still a long time, especially if you oh, yeah, need definitely. to run and move and uh, you do some, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> and absolutely. And the thing is, obviously, I mean, even though you've choreographed everything, you know, a minute in your head sounds like a long time. Mm. I mean, you know, I've seen people that do a count that actually will count loud in the background. Um, 
But normally performance-wise, you know, you do your stunt, whatever you've rehearsed, and unless you hear someone saying, you know, to get put out down, um, you carry on performing. Um, obviously, at the end of the day, the thing is when you're doing fire stunts, if you do have other people around you, you have to be very aware that obviously at the end of the day, if you trip, you know, your vision is very minute when you're looking through these, you know, silicon masks. So you could fall mm. and land on someone. I think the most trickiest burn that I did was on Hitman's Bodyguard, which is at the end of the film. Uh, so the end of the film, you know, uh, Samuel Jackson's character has escaped from prison. He's in some kind of South American bar dancing with Samuel Hayek. And out of nowhere, a bar fight stuff ha happens. And a guy comes in on fire in the background, stumbling through stuff out of frame as the camera sort of zooms in and closes on the actors. Now, that for me was probably the most scariest job I've ever done because all it needs is someone to slip and trip or land on me or me to go. And I'm on fire with my, you know, obviously, if you're not expecting, you're going to go flying mm -hmm. and land on someone. And our two principal actors were wearing, well, basically, they were no, dis no different distance from where you were. Mm -hmm. I was running past here. And obviously, I'd rehearsed it that when I did the stunt, because my worry was the visibility. Plus, I got lights inside the, the set. Um, and all you need to do is lose your bearings and you have no idea. And also, what ends to happen is that sometimes your lenses fog up. Mm -hmm. So if your lenses fog up and you lose concentration, you don't know where you are. So you'd have to literally go down onto the floor. So I changed the fire stunt to suit my performance. So I moved the snooker table or a pool table where I was coming in through a doorway right in front. So I knew that as soon as I came in, I would hit the table and buckle up on it. I then turned 45 degrees, went running along the, uh, hit the bar, the actual bar of the actual the club, went along the bar, and then I used my hand at the bottom to know that I was at the end of it. Mm. And at the end of the bar, there was a dance stage, which obviously, you know, a little platform. But if I turn and clip that, there's a chance I'd go flying, either go through the set mm. or just land in a heap. So we rehearsed this multiple times, and then I rehearsed it with my eyes closed. Now, even though it's something that's relatively simple, mm. my concern was the cast and the other stuntmen. Mm -hmm. Either I would trip and land on one of them, or one of them could trip and land on me. But the main thing, as long as I didn't lose my bearings, um, and that it was it was a confined space, um, and you know we got it in one take and it was great and you know it all went perfect. But it could obviously gone the other way. Any other like most complex stunts that you did that you remember? Well, another another burn that I did, which was out in a western, I went and shot out in Almeria in Spain, a, a film called The Long Kill, um, where I played a bandit, a, a baddie, and. We're inside a cave. I come out on a horse. Um, our hero shoots. The horse rears. I got a torch, and I land on a campfire. Yeah. And I get set on fire. And kind of as I'm flailing around, he gets his shotgun or his, he, you know, his Winchester rifle and shoots me, and I, f and I fall down dead. And we decided that I was going to fall forwards, just land across across the fire. But what happened was that I didn't have too much gel on my side. So when I was doing my wailing around, the flames hit me in the face and caught me on slightly surprised so i shifted my performance from where i was standing to about another five feet to my right not realizing that where i was going to land there was a drop so i did my bullet hit knowing that we're not going to go again so i did a reaction it wasn't as good as the reaction i'd like to have done because the flames were really hit me in the face and i did my reaction and as i fell i remember not hitting the ground continuously going and i must have fallen about 10 foot onto the ground And I did one and a half turns in midair, which was never planned. Mm. But because I wasn't expecting it, I didn't get hurt. Mm. Which, land, you know, jumping side on onto the ground, even though it's gravel, mm. from 10 foot. No, of course. You know, um, but I wasn't wearing any pads uh, because, in theory, there was no reason for me to wear pads. I was going to take the bullet here mm. and just, you know, just do a fall onto the floor. Mm. Um, so that one was a tricky one. That one slightly went wrong, but, you know, and it's funny because when you see it, obviously they weren't expecting me to go to so the camera kind of going, you know, had to follow me. So mm. a bit jerky, but it still worked really well and it actually looks pretty good. Uh, but that wasn't planned. Mm. Um, and there was no reason to put boxes and stuff because by right, something that was so simple, mm. and I had vision because I wasn't wearing a mask, but the thing of just shifting me across because the flames caught me mm. um, was fine. It's just I didn't realize that where I was going, there was a drop. Uh, it, didn't, it didn't come out. Um, but yeah, that was, that was one that, you know, kind of went wrong but I, I kind of got got away with it uh, what are the most dangerous stunts to plan is there like a type that you know that like okay well do this one this you need to be extremely careful and thoughtful 
I would say that my, a lot of my colleagues might dis, not disagree. I mean, everything has an element of danger. Mm -hmm. Of course. Where you have elements of horses and people. I mean, anything where you've got, if you've got cars flipping, you know, mm -hmm. anything where basically something can lose control. Final score, for example, we got a great stunt double for David Batista, uh, who's a magnificent on a bike. Um, and, you know, he's got to be dodging in and out of these corridors, you know, on a bike at speed. It's not speeded up. Mm -hmm. Um, and we had a mixture of, of background artists mm -hmm. and stunts. And obviously, you know, going forward at speed, as long as obviously, you know, if I've got stunt guys going in front, it's fine. We had background artists all around the sides. But there's a bit where he's got to obviously take the bike, throw the back end, to then go through another set of doors down the other end of the stadium. Mm -hmm. And we, we, you know, we looked at it, we, we walked it through, we did the first part, and now we're overlapping to do the bit where he obviously loses the back end of it. And I went, you know what? I don't really want to put any people there. Uh, I don't have any other stunt guys. We've seen everyone. Let's just have it blank. And lucky that we did, because as he's taken the bike, the back end's gone. It's gone straight into the wall, which looked great. Mm. But if you would have had someone there. Yeah. So it's not the fact that the stunt's gone wrong. It's just that at the end of the day, that wasn't foreseen because he didn't do anything different. Mm. It's just unfortunate the back wheel just went. Um, so really, to be honest, at the end of the day, um, Every stunt has to be planned. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we do, like I said, a job of a hazardous nature, but everything's rehearsed and planned. And when you're doing multiple takes, you know, and there's always that fine line when you go, you know what, that's good, but we can do better, you know, because you can see there's a gap or there's a waiting for a reaction. Um, but I think, you know, once everything's planned, you know, and it's worked out, as long as you're not hurried, everything normally goes 100%. Mm. And then, I mean, like, you need then someone who can execute it. Absolutely, but that's the thing. You have the right person for the right job. You know, and obviously, um, everybody obviously wants to step up. You know, sometimes you kind of go on a smaller job, you know, like I said, with a fire job. You know, if you're, if you're going to set someone on fire, you know, unless you trust someone. Like I said, at the end of the day, you know, everyone has to jump in at the deep end at some point. Um, but if you're doing something where there's lots of elements that are going on, you want someone that you know you can depend you know, from a fire point of view, you don't have to worry. He'll do his own, not his own safety, but he'll get himself prepared. He knows what he needs to do. You don't have to then spend time, you know, especially on a big job. You haven't got time. It's, there's so much going on. Mm. So on smaller jobs that, you know, you obviously might have more time to, you know, go through stuff. Um, but normally you try and pick the person that's got a bit of experience or someone that you already have worked with that you go, you know what, they're fine with it. So, you know, if someone's really into swimming, you know, the other who's, you know, or, or let's say free diving, holding their breath for them is, is, is not, you know, the hardest part for anyone is obviously a performance, which when you're doing something that's not in your nature, you know, to all of a sudden hold your breath and run around bashing into stuff, uh, but making it look like you're a robot, because that's the hardest part, is making the performance believable mm. within within the stunt. As a stunt coordinator, do you usually, uh, do you pick your own team who you work with? Yeah, I mean, I have, we all have our favourites. And when I say favourites, it's people that you're comfortable working with. But obviously, the bigger the films are, you know, if you, there's certain stunt guys that, what I call fit, certain criteria is what I call the hero height, mm -hmm. you know, certain builds and heights. So you automatically think of them. You know, a few of my colleagues who double all the lead, you know, with any American actor, or even English actor, lead actor who's obviously about six foot, you always think of them because one, they're very competent, you know, um, they've got the right build. It's, it's easy to make someone that's, you know, kind of mega ripped and smaller, mm -hmm. you know, and pad them up than someone who's obviously really big, mm -hmm. doubling a smaller guy. You know, I have my own team of people that obviously, you know, who I've worked with over many years. Uh, but then obviously as your jobs get bigger and you have to have, you know, different doubles and whatever, then, you know, you, p you pick the appropriate double mm. to do the appropriate job. But as long as you know that you're comfortable, that you know that they can do the job. Can someone who is not on the register do stunts in UK or they, like, it's not allowed by law? No, there is no law. I mean, yeah, there are people that obviously perform. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the BSR, which is the British Stunt Register, uh, or the Equity Stunt Register, as it used to be called, um, was the only professional organization mm -hmm. back in the day when it started 1974 mm -hmm. uh and it is it's it's it has a standard because obviously to become a performer you have to reach all these levels of skills mm -hmm. which cover all aspects of filming mm -hmm. so at the end of the, you know that if you've got someone that's going to get thrown out of a window or whatever it is an eighth story you know block of flats that if you're picking someone that's obviously on the stunt register who's obviously done you know training for falls they are spatially aware so you know at the end of the day that you're comfortable knowing that obviously when they go out, they know when they are upside down and when to ball out and land on their back or on their, their side or whatever. Um, but you obviously do have people. I mean, you know, when you think other countries make films, they don't have a stunt register. But over here, uh, I've, we have 
certain groups um, who aren't on the stunt register, uh, who work, but they mainly get employed not because of their ability, because of what they charge. So really, at the end of the day, sounding horrible, that's it's what it comes down to. It's down to do with cost. Mm. Um, but you know, we are the only recognised organisation. I mean, you have people that obviously aren't on the stunt register that work for people on the stunt register. Mm. And I've used people who have got very high skills, mm. like some of my other coordinators. You know, if you want someone from a certain background that you can't find the accurate, uh, appropriate person, you look outside. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, and you know, we do have. I mean, at the moment, we have just under five hundred members on the British Stunt Register. Mm. And I think the Facebook page of the unofficial register, which is people that are training, is about a thousand, mm. if I'm not mistaken. Mm. So very different to when I first started. It was a much more secretive thing, you know. Mm. There was there wasn't like DVDs and making of and as you do now, like I said, you can go on the internet now and find every, you know, and action films now, there's loads. There's so much, you know what I mean? Like I said, on streaming, I mean, you know, streaming now is like the new film. There's so much content that comes out that's action orientated, you know? Let's talk about the Volvo <laughs> commercials. So the, the, the famous split. Can you tell me more about like, first of all, how did it, uh, How did they find you? How did you like? Was was the idea of the split? Is it was it your idea or like they came to you with a script? And how did you do it? Is it really Jean Claude Van Damme doing the split on 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 the chunks or not? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I ironically I covered a coordinator friend of mine on a job for Volvo. He was actually asked to do it, which wasn't the Volvo one originally. This was the first one I did, which was called, was called Ballerina. Uh, and the whole aspect of all the Volvo commercials is every time they release one of their tractors, their trucks, is what modifications they've done. So obviously the stunts is to incorporate and show how the stunt can be performed safely, you know, to do with reversing or dynamic steering because of the trucks. So the first one was called Ballerina, which was going to be originally um, Philippe Petit, the very famous uh, man who did, you know, the Twin Towers, you know, tightrope guy. And the idea was, how it was written, was basically him with two trucks going down the motorway, him going across. After much discussion, we decided not to use Philippe Petit, and we wanted something a little bit different. So we used a young lady called Faith Dickey, who um, was a champion in slacklining, mm-hmm. uh, which she's not a tightrope artist, but she uh, does slacklining, which is um, something that's devised from rock climbing, where they obviously got, you know, strut between two trees or rocks, and, you know, you, you perform on that. Um, So she came out to do that. So that was that was my first involvement with Volvo. Um, and it came out phenomenal. I mean, we shot that out in Croatia. We couldn't find any other motorway that we could close down. But this motorway in Croatia um, hadn't been completed yet. So we had access to two, to basically the, the, both sides of the motorway, which is where we shot it. Um, and then I did another commercial for them at the same time, which was called Service on the Go, which, if anything, is probably the most dangerous stunt I've coordinated, which was kind of Indiana Jones, Uh, Raise of the Lost Art, where we have our hero, who's supposed to be a mechanic, underneath the truck, fixing. And the aspect is of this commercial is that if your truck breaks down anywhere in the world, that you can make a phone call and they'll send that an engineer. Mm-hmm. So the idea is that you've got this truck driving as a family in a car. A little girl looks out the window and she sees basically a guy underneath the truck, however he's holding on, fix it. And then he comes out of the truck, a you know, van pulls up, the door opens and we pull him in. Mm. And that was done with uh, a luge board um, performer. Uh, I'd been watching some program on Channel 4, I think it was, where it was like contestants doing like mad stunts and stuff. Not film stunts, but you know, things that weren't, that we'd never ever get to do. And I had this guy uh, called Will, Will Stevenson, who I saw. And I didn't know what luge boarding was at the time. It was like, oh, it's like a big skateboard where they go down, you know, these roads at high speed. Cut to about a year later, when I got, obviously when I did this job and I got both scripts and I went, That reads to me, not so much a stunt, because it is a stunt, but to have someone come out and do whatever, I think that's the guy. I didn't even know what the sport was called. I couldn't even remember. I remember trying to do some research on the internet, and I found what the program was, and I contacted him, and I said, Look, I'm doing this commercial. You don't know me from nowhere. I think you'd be great for this commercial, because it wasn't so much I had to use a stunt. It was just someone that basically had made this skateboard that you could make it, make it look like a, a mechanics you know, board, mm-hmm. um, traveling at speeds. So I brought him out to creation. He did a great job. Um, but we were doing it at speed and obviously the, the safety factors that I had in place was still, it, you know, it was, it was a stunt that, you know, at the end of the day could have gone right. It, it went perfectly well. Um, 
but it was probably one of the most dangerous things that I've actually had to put together mm. where it was it was like you see in the films where someone's actually hidden underneath a truck while it going at speed then having to come out but from the idea from the ballerina one I then got con in contact they got in contact with me again to do the next commercial which at the time was basically we've got an idea uh, for our new trucks, which is about our dynamic steering, where we've got a person on the top of the two trucks uh, and the trucks are reversing backwards. And so I flew over to Sweden for a meeting. I said, well, that's kind of like when you've seen it on a film where you've got someone on two horses mm -hmm. and the heroes across both horses and there's like a tree stump or a tree and he's in between. The only fact is that you're going backwards. I said, there's not much, not danger, but no, it's not dynamic having just a person standing, you know, even though it's still pretty cool. Mm -hmm. But what about if, what, if the trucks pull apart? And you're going that in the split. So it was a combined effort, obviously, has, having this idea. But at the time, it was still going to be on top of the trucks. Um, and it was like, well, that's fine. I said, but if we move it further down and do it on the mirrors. Now, in discussions, it was obviously, well, who could, you know, could I could find lots of stuff, you know, very flexible, you know, that obviously would fit our criteria, you know, the way they wanted him to look, um, that could do splits. But obviously, it came. The first thing was like, who is the most famous person in the world that is known for doing splits? <laughs> Jean Claude. And being that he'd already been doing other commercials like the Cause Beers, uh, they approached him, and he said yes. Um, so we decided to do it on the wing mirrors. But the only thing that I said is that obviously, even though we had a safety system put in place, which you don't see, um, is that I had to make some brackets for the mirrors. So because everyone that's going to watch this is going to go, this is not real, because it's impossible that someone can balance with their heels on a set of massive wing mirrors that are kind of like dome shape. Mm -hmm. So we built some brackets, which I said, obviously, you know, in, a, in an interview or if you do a making of, you can show that these brackets that we made, and all it was was basically a platform mm -hmm. that was flat. So when he's got his feet, you know, he could turn them so he could do the splits. Yeah. Um, I flew out, we shot it in Spain, in Ciudad Real, uh, and a disused airport. So it was, was, was an airport in Spain that's no longer no, no longer used. And we were there for a week. Um, not so much designing because we knew what we had to do. The fact is that originally it was never going to be shot in one take. So what you see as the final um, commercial wasn't planned. It was actually done in cuts. So it was a bit more comical in the sense that we still had the, the splits, same narrative, but then you would cut to the driver inside looking out, seeing Van Damme, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. kind of looking. It's only on the rehearsal that when we actually did it with a stunt double just to practice it before Jean-Claude arrived, that with the camera car with the Russian arm, that we actually got it in one well, in one take. So we did another couple of rehearsals and it was decided that he's like, well, why do we need to cut this? Just do it with one continuous take, uh, which is what we ended up doing. Um, and we had it nailed within about the fourth day. Um, so the rehearsal of it. The one thing obviously which you know, people obviously they'll ask me, you know, oh, it was CG'd, it was done forwards and played backwards. No. The first thing is that even the best driver in the world reversing, if you're looking at your rear view mirror and you've only got a black road, there's nothing to um to focus on, your truck could go anywhere, even though you're trying to keep it straight. So what I decided to do, which was obviously part of my prep, is that we use some of the lines on the on the actual um tarmac for the you know the runway for one of the trucks to have its wheels on. And then when I did my measurements, which is obviously where the truck starts to where it pulls out, I had the art department literally make me some markers a kilometre long. So up to the point that we were rehearsing this just on our own with boxes and stuff just to see, you know, uh, the same size as obviously the, you know, the, the actual brackets. They'd actually done for me a kilometre from the main line that we use. There could be no variation. They had to measure every other three meters to make sure that the line didn't go further out. And it had to be plumb with masking tape all the way down. And obviously the difference between it not being right is that if it went slightly more than the line, then obviously where his foot is, the truck would go in. He'd obviously his leg would go past. Mm. So before we even attempted to get to the rehearsals, I had to make sure that it was perfect. There couldn't be even two inches Mm. It had to be better less, but it had to be. So the line that we had was plumb and we measured off that. Um, and that's how we did it. And if you actually look at the actual commercial, um, I'm directing all the action from another vehicle and you'll see a little, there's like a bit like a red mark on the actual moat, on the actual tarmac, which is where I then start giving the command for the drivers to start pulling apart mm -hmm. and then to hold that position. And, we shot this at 6.29 in the morning. We had two attempts where we were going to have two attempts here. One, if we didn't get it right, was at sunrise. 
And if we never got it, we would then try and attempt it again at sunset. Mm. But if we, but the fact is, during the day we would have done it, and up until that point, and got it with normal, you know, with the light already up. But the idea was that if we couldn't get it at sunrise, which gave you this beautiful look, um, was to attempt it again in the evening when it was sunset. But we managed to get it wow. in the first take, which in the rehearsals it had gone perfectly. Um, and obviously we got to do it in the one take. So it's probably the most quickest job, apart from the setup. We were setting up at five o'clock in the morning. The trucks were already set up for the night before, but then obviously we'd come in the morning, check everything. We had one little play. We had obviously lights at the airport, which obviously we don't turned off. Um, and we got it right, put the trucks at back number ones, set everything up, and then we were ready to go. So literally once we had to go, obviously, you know, we went through the whole stunt, and at 6.29, so literally by 6.30, we were done. It was uh, the shortest day I've had on camera. <laughs> and it's really Jean-Claude Van Damme's thing. Jean-Claude, yes. He yes. came in on the fourth day. I'd, pro I'd worked previously with him before on a feature film called Legionnaire mm -hmm. in Morocco for a colleague of mine, one of my mentors, Greg Powell. Um, so that was, that was my last, my only time I'd worked with him. But obviously, you know, it's in that time, obviously, you know, I'd watched all these films and before that. So still a massive fan. Mm -hmm. Um so, you know, we got chatting, obviously, you know, sharing the rehearsal with a stunt double, or I should say stunt performer. It wasn't a stunt double, but stunt performer. And then we did it, and, you know, it, it's quite daunting when you've got, you know, a truck going back at a certain speed and you've got the wind hitting, you know, and it's obviously you're trying to keep your balance, let alone doing the splits. But he did a remarkable job, and we nailed it, and it was, um, yeah. It's the only job I'll admit that I actually cried when we cut. I was, like, jumping up and down, screaming. Yeah. I got out of the car, and it was, yeah, it was... It was great. We knew it was going to be a successful commercial, just didn't realise how big it was going to be. I mean, there, there, there were like so many parodies. Shannon Tatum did one. <laughs> they did the Chuck Norris one. Yeah. I mean, it's been copied by so many people around the world. Mm. Um, and when you think that's 10 years ago. Yeah. So it's 10 years ago that we did it. Um, I would say in my career as a crowning moment, it's not an action film, but as something that I kind of helped devise, mm -hmm. put together, um, yeah, I'm very proud of it. And like I said, I had a great, I had a great team, you know, it's, uh, yeah. and the DOP, you know, Ed Wilde, amazing job. Yeah. Um, it I was mean, great. Everyone knows, like, I think almost everyone, the people at least like who are not, you know, who, who were not like older than 15 or like 12 back then. Yes. They, they know that the commercial. Yeah, it was, um, I mean, I'm still, you know, every time I see it or someone mentions it, I kind of get a grin. It's like, you know, it's a great achievement. And obviously, you know, when something goes according to plan, mm -hmm. you know, the thing about doing something on film or commercial, you know, is that you, you don't have just one go at it, you know, it can take multiple takes. But the fact that we got it on the first take, mm -hmm. um, it was amazing, you know, and I can remember sort of getting out, out of my, out of the vehicle, the vehicle that I was tracking alongside. Uh, and it was just, it was, I don't know, it was, it was like winning the World Cup. I mean, for me as a job, mm -hmm. it was amazing. It was, it was a great achievement, you know, and to do something with an iconic actor that you've grown up with. Mm -hmm. um, it's amazing. And then obviously when the commercial came out, I think we had 20 million views within the first day. Mm -hmm. um, and then my phone didn't stop ringing with people wanting to ask me, um, had we done it for real? Mm. Was it done in reverse? Was it in the studio? And it's mm. like, no, you know, um, they were making, I think they did a making up, but they never really released it. Um, and other people have tried to kind of emulate it, you know, um, yeah, it's an iconic, it's an mm -hmm. iconic commercial. You know, it's the, it's the kind of commercial that, you know, in all these programs that they do, like, you know, commercials of the, of the years 2000, you know, mm. it'll be there, you know. So, so you, you shot it like very quickly, but how long did it take you to, to prepare to, to basically think through everything? How long did you prepare before you started shooting it? All right. So I had a couple of meetings, obviously, once the, um, we agreed that was a route we were going to go. Um, I did a couple of trips to, to Sweden. Uh, my homework, we did some rehearsals here. Um, just basic tests, um, but obviously because the commercial was going to take place in Spain, obviously that's where we went to. Mm. Um, but I had four days, so four days, you know, um, from you know looking at the proper costume, you know what I mean. Obviously getting the brackets, make sure they would work, and like I said, having our, my my stunt assistant, one of my assistants, um, obviously was able to do the splits um, to make sure that it worked. Because obviously at the end of the day, you know, it was never planned to be done in one take. Mm -hmm. So the gag is John Claude doing the splits. The fact that people then think, oh, it's been done in a studio mm. or, you know, it's not him or it's a dummy, um, that was really irrelevant. The fact mm. was, could we do it? Can we do it with John Vlod Van Damme mm -hmm. on, on two trucks going backwards? Um, the fact that we, when we got to do the rehearsal, we got to do it and we didn't then just stop. We just carried on going. And I remember when we, um, when we did the commercial, uh, the actual, the actual day that we shot it, 
we could have carried on going the whole length of the airport, the actual runway, which it's not so much as it's a world record. We could have gone much longer. They could have written the dialogue as in the voiceover, right? Mm. Um, much more. They could have, I don't know, you could have been reciting the alphabet, you know, talking about, because we just carried on going. We just had it perfect. Mm. I mean, the drivers that I had weren't stunt drivers. They were drivers from Volvo. That's what I was actually wanted, wanted to ask you because I'm I'm guessing there's not so many stunt drivers who are actually professionals and you know driving. No, there's some great. There's some great. No, we've got some great truck drivers. I mean, like I said, you know, but you know, they can take a truck on two wheels. You know, that can flip a truck. But my idea was, um, and obviously it helped Volvo. Apart from their campaign, was that these trucks are meant for drivers. Mm -hmm. You know, as in obviously, you know, as in. So having a stunt driver that, you know, it's, it's different if you're trying to do a stunt where you've got the truck sliding and doing stuff, then you kind of go, yeah, your average truck driver can't do that. Mm. But the fact that these guys drive their trucks 24-7, they're going to drive the trucks, in that sense, better than anyone else, mm. you know. Um, and, you know, as far as hitting marks, I mean, you know, they weren't sliding. They just had to basically move from one position into another and hold that position. And they did a great job. Mm. I mean, to be honest, um, amazing, you know. I mean, they were, they were part of the reason it all worked as well. But I mean, you know, having the right people. Mm. So in this case, they weren't crashing through stuff, mm -hmm. which ironically, the next Volvo commercial that I did, did involve that. Mm. Um, but this particular commercial, you know, which involved precision driving, which basically meant just pulling out onto a line and making sure that it, it followed that, that line that they were on all the way to the end. You know what I mean? So did a great job. What would you say for people who want to do what you do? What would be the step-by-step -step instruction? I would say if anyone if anyone is thinking about it, follow your dream. Mm -hmm. the, the, you know, I think in this day and age now, with obviously technology that that can point you in the right direction. When I started training, you know, um, it was where do I go? I mean, apart from obviously having the rules and regulations, whereas now you can type in and find out martial arts class where you live, mm -hmm. horse riding, whatever the skills that you pick. But I would say that if if someone's thinking of serious about doing it, then go and do it. You know, um, obviously the criteria has changed. There's a few more things that have been added, which you need days in front of camera as a background artist, which oh, really? when I, yeah, you would have to contact the British Stunt Register, mm -hmm. ask them to send you a list of requirements. Mm -hmm. So obviously they change every so often. I don't keep abreast of it because obviously, I mean, my son's training, which is now my, my assistant. So he works for me now. He's just turned 18 and he's been training since he was about 16. Mm -hmm. um, so he works for me as my assistant you know, looking after the stunt team, you know, getting teas, coffees, moving mats, uh, you know, basically as, as an assistant. And then with obviously what he gets paid is what he does in stunt training. But the qualifications do change. So obviously they're still the same, but they might add something or they might take something away. So once you get your list of requirements and you've decided what you want to do, then you figure out where you're going to do it. So if you're going to do, let's say, high board diving, I think there's only two swimming pools in the UK that have a 10 meter board. I think one's at Crystal Palace, and I think the other one is up north somewhere, I think. Um, so that's the first thing you'd have to find out is where you can do, you know, those certain skills. Finding out where they are is one thing. Having something local to you is something else. Mm -hmm. I was very fortunate when I was living in London, everything was in London. It was like, you know, either a car drive or a bus ride away. Um, but obviously now, you know, with so many people around the UK that may not have a 10-meter board or, you know, it's like with parachuting. You know, a lot of people that do parachuting go abroad because the weather is much better. So obviously, you know, you don't have, you know, it's, so that makes perfect sense. Scuba diving, you can dive anywhere, obviously, unless you want to go and do it in warm waters, you know, but you can dive anywhere in the United Kingdom, you know, mm. uh, Bezac or Paddy. Um, trampolining, obviously, to find a recognized gymnasium or gymnastics. So once you know the qualifications that you, that they ask for and the standard, then it's down to you to then find out where to do that, mm. learn, get the certificate for that particular award, which has to be filmed when you go for that award. So if you're going for your brown belt or your black belt, you have to make sure that obviously, you know, you've got a video of you going for your grading, you know, mm -hmm. obviously asking permission if you can video it, which is proof of you doing your training. And once you've got everything you've asked for, you would then submit it to the British Stunt Register, which obviously they would look across everything. And if you've done everything they've asked for, then by right, you should be accepted. How long uh, does it usually take for people to, to basically from from start to end to get in the register with all the training? It depends if you're starting from scratch, if you kind of do the basic basic maths. If you've never done martial arts, I would say probably martial arts is the longest one. To get a black belt or a brown belt, at least the level before uh, a black belt, two and a half years. Mm. So if you're going for a grade in every three months, 
make sure that you pass every grading. Then by the time you've obviously got to that, so that's two and a half years. Um, let's say three years for argument's sake. Then you're talking about scuba diving, to go and do your dives, your rock climbing, horse riding, gymnastics. See, gymnastics isn't time related, it's level related. So it's like with horse riding. If you went and horse rid and went every day and you're a natural, once you take the horse test, if you pass, you might have been riding a year, mm -hmm. I might be riding for three years. Gymnastics is exactly the same. Gymnastics is about what you need to do for the exam. But you could be a natural person that all of a sudden takes to doing back some sorts and everything else and every other every aspect of that exam much quicker than someone else who might take three years. So if you're looking at it, I would say minimum three years. Mm -hmm. Minimum. Could take you four or five. And also there's the financial aspect of it, because obviously things are more expensive now. When I first started training martial arts, if I can remember it was one pound sixty a lesson. And you only paid when you went. Now with a lot of martial art clubs, it's eighty pound a month. So if you don't go, you're still paying that. So if you add all that up over a period of three years, and you're scuba diving, hmm. my scuba diving, if I'm not mistaken, when I did it, cost me sixteen hundred around to do, and that was at the time it was a four week intensive um, in Bovis Sand to get my what they call health and safety, my HSE Part Four. Whereas now, you can't do like, you know, um, a blitz course where you can go and pass. If you go and do your diving, you have to have d at least do dives over a period of a year. So the health and safety exam, which you can go and do in four weeks, which is what they used to ask for, and it's, you can still use it now, but that's four weeks. doesn't mean that you're going to be a great diver. It just means that you've done, you know, an intensive course and passed. So even if you get that, you still have to have dives up to about a year. So you can't just get that. Trampolining, gymnastics, that's skill, a bit, uh, um, skill more than time. So obviously, you know, you could be trampolining for six months, seven months. And if I didn't know that, I'd go, well, you've been trampolining for years. So as long as you can then pass the exam mm. to the level that they ask, and obviously hitting those points perfectly, then you get that certificate. But diving, martial arts, um, scuba diving, those really at the end of the day are time related. You know what I mean? So the diving, you could go and do uh, an intensive, you know, uh, diving course, but it doesn't mean make you a proficient diver just means that you've gone and done it. So they ask for certain things over a period of a year just to show that you carry on doing that. So obviously your level is a year, about a year for each skill. It's a lot of time and money as well. I think the average person looking at it now about £35,000, wow. give or take. Yeah. Yeah, my figures might be wrong, but things have gone up. Mm. You know, it's rally driving, which is a, you know, it's a great one, you know, to go and do rally driving. Unless you, unless you do rally driving as a hobby, if you go to a club where you actually rent the car for a day with a spotter with you in the car, I think the average race is about fifteen hundred pound, mm -hmm. and I think they ask for for minimum. I think it's eight races. I might be wrong. It's changed a little bit. Eight or ten races, but it doesn't mean that you just have to do eight or ten races. You can't come last in all of them, or you know, it doesn't mean you have to win them all. Mm -hmm. But you could do maybe eight races, and on five of them, you're eighth. Mm -hmm. They don't count, not all of them. So that means, so it's not even the eight races. You might have to do fifteen, you know. Uh, and if you've got twenty people in a race, in a, in a, in a, you know, in a in a rally, then obviously same thing. You know, as long as you don't come last on, on all of them, right? Uh, but you know that that skill on its own, mm. it's about fifteen grand, fourteen <laughs> grand. Yeah. You know? And how different is the system, well, in comparison to the US, for example? Well, the US again. I mean, um, they don't have. A stunt um, organization. What they have, they have stunt teams, stuntmen's association, stunts unlimited, brand X, eighty seven eleven, um, which they govern themselves. And obviously, if they're looking for people, that obviously it's people that have a certain background. Could be from martial arts, could be from rally driving, highboard diving. Um, so they don't really, we, they don't have a qualification system. But it's worked for them, obviously, since the beginning of Hollywood. So you know. Uh, the fact that we had an organization is obviously just, you know, we're British and obviously we do things in a different way, you know. Do you think it's it's safer in general? I think with anything that you do when there's an element of danger, I think some kind of training is important. The fact that ours is quite extreme, you know, you've got job school, that's three years, you know. Most professions at the end of the day, you know, um, unless it's, you know, has has some kind of qualification system. I think ours... Is, is, is a benchmark. You know, the fact that we actually set up an organizational system to basically prove, or at least when you've got people that know what they're doing, 
um, I think, especially in what we do, is 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 very important. Mm. You know, you, you if you've got someone that obviously has done high board diving that can actually you know knows how to come off a ten meter board and do all different shapes, you know, going into water. At the end of the day, when they're going to be falling out of a window or getting thrown off something, they know how to. You know what I mean? They know how to. Even though they have to unlearn everything because they're not going to be diving in water doing. You know, they're mm-hmm. saying, but the fact is that they are spatially aware. Mm-hmm. Same with fighting. At the end of the day, do you have to be a black belt? Maybe not. But the fact is, that if you've done martial arts, you know how to throw a punch and block mm-hmm. and kick, mm-hmm. and you've sparred, then fight choreography is going to come naturally. You know, every martial arts different. You know. It's only now that things are much more stylized. You know, if you look at how things have progressed, you know, apart from you know, all types of fights. But if you have someone that obviously knows how to throw a punch, knows how to block, has sparred, especially getting to that level, uh, obviously when they come to do fighting, you know, it's not as if you're taking someone that has done a couple of days in a theater workshop, mm-hmm. you know, or done a couple of lessons at the end of the day. You know, that's, that's the whole point of having the qualifications is that you have an elite team of professionals that their skill level is very high. Let's talk about the judgment call. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so when I was doing my research, I found out that you are directing, uh, was it like a fan film about Judge Dredd? Can you tell me more about how did it happen, why, and what's the plan for it? Yeah. Um, all right. So growing up, where obviously I was into comics, you know, obviously you had DC, you had Marvel. I grew up with 2000 AD, English version of, you know, those, of comics, superheroes and stuff. And, you know, and it was Judge Dredd. So growing up, obviously, even though I knew about other comics, Judge Dredd was always big in, you know, in growing, growing up as a kid. And when they first made the first feature film in 94, uh, I came very close to being Stallone's double. Hmm. About that close. <laughs> But it didn't happen. Anyway, so cut to 2012 with the Carl Urban one. Again, same thing. Came very close to working on it. Didn't work on it. Now we cut to me and a couple of friends going, you know what, we're not working at the moment. Why don't we try and make a little little film? You know, something to have a bit of fun. So I got a friend of mine who's a director to write a little script. And I'd already been introduced to a few people that had some Judge Dredd props, costumes and stuff. She was shot a little trailer, little teaser at my friend's martial arts studio. Very simple, me playing a character with Judge Dredd and a friend of mine doing some visual effects. Looked great. So we thought, wow, we could do a little fan film. Anyway, I ended up going to work on a job. My friend who's a director ended up going to do something else. And then when I had time to think about it, I think, you know what? I'd like to do this my own project. So I decided myself to obviously do a little Judge Dredd fan film. Um, after final school, ironically. So what happened was uh, I got introduced to a friend of mine, um, who became a friend of mine, who ran a shop. It had a shopping center that had been closed down by the council. And it turned it into like an interactive zombie event. Mm. Where you'd go there and basically, you know, over a pit, over, a, over three floors, it was an immersive, you know, kind of experience with actors dressed up as zombies. He was a massive Judge Dredd fan. I went to meet him and I was, it was like amazing. This place looks, it's apocalyptic. Plus, he had people with make, that did makeup. He had a lot of Judge Dredd pot, uh, props. So we spoke and we said, look, if we do this thing together, I showed him what we'd done with my other friend. I said, this is what I want to do. He said, yep, I can give everything for free. Don't want anything out of it. You know, we just have a bit of fun. I then went to Florida on holiday with my kids and my wife. This was after final school and after having this meeting. We planned to, when I came back, to plan all this and shoot probably about Christmas. So this was now September. The day that I got back from Florida, I had a phone call from my new friend saying, Peter, uh, the council have asked for their property back. He had it for nine years, paying a rent, you know. They've sold it. They're going to knock it down and build flats. <laughs> So all of a sudden, this great idea that I had wasn't that it couldn't be done. It's just that where am I going to find a shopping center mm-hmm. that had like a Resident Evil laboratory, had cars that would go on fire. I mean, it was amazing. It was like a set, but it was basically for the zombie kind of, you know, and he used to rent it out to music videos and stuff. So I kind of went, I'm really sorry you've lost your business. Anyway, forgot all about it. About two days later, it's knock on my door. It's a massive parcel. I'd forgotten that I'd ordered a Judge Dredd costume which was the idea of obviously whoever was going to be Judge Dredd in my film would wear this costume so I wouldn't have to borrow you know, this person's one, obviously, which is an authentic one and get it ruined. So I've, gone, I've now got a costume, but no film. <laughs> so anyway, I tried it on and kind of looked at him and it looked great. And I thought, you know what? Let me wait. I'll call my friend back. And I said, listen, look, I know we can't do a short film, but can I just maybe go and shoot some stuff there just dressed as a judge, maybe do a fight scene? He goes, look, I'm here for the next four weeks. 
can't have anyone here. I've got the local council checking for asbestos and stuff. I need to take out nine years worth of equipment. He had an armory there. Set, I mean, set bills that he'd made. He said, on the last week, there's a chance you might be able to come in for a day or so, right? So I'll have to be out here in four weeks by, by the Friday. So I waited until the particular day I turned up thinking with a couple of my friends that we could do this little fight scene that everything had been stripped. I mean, it was still an abandoned shopping center, but all the sets that he had were dismantled, all the guns had been gone. And it was like, oh, he goes, yeah, I'm here until Friday. So if you want to do anything, you've got now until, until Friday. So I don't know what possessed me. I made a phone call and I ended up having a lot of my stunt friends that came down that have other little sidelines, carpenters, builders. And we basically ended up making sets over a period of four days. Mm. No story. It was just basic. We didn't know what we were going to shoot. I then contacted a few friends of mine who are actors, a DOP, a special effects guy. Anyway, we built sets there from the Tuesday morning until the Friday. In that time, I'd put an advert out for cosplayers to come if they wanted to be in a short film, but if they had their own costumes. And we were literally, because there was no light going in, we didn't even know what time of day it was. We were literally building sets mm. for nearly 24 hours a day. Cut to the Friday, we had two days. He said, well, I can extend this until Sunday, but Sunday, I have to be gone out of here because Monday, that's it. The, the council come in to start marking where they're going to knock down, you know. So we shot for two days, dialogue, action, no clue what we're doing as far as no script. I'm directing, I'm helping build props. Um, I had my kids involved, my wife involved. Um, anyway, we shot all this stuff, left, and then my friend who does vision effects started editing stuff, and we had... Something actually looked great, but with no real context. Mm. We had a raid, we had an infirmary, uh, we had all these body parts, which is like a body harvesting kind of facility. And I thought, you know what? I'll then I'll decide to write a story around this and try and figure out somewhere else. Anyway, next thing you know, we haven't stopped working. So the project got shelved for a, for a long time. But every time I showed someone clips of it, people go, oh, when are you going to finish this? Cut to, we're now in COVID. Mm -hmm. So... No idea about Judge Dredd, about continuing it. I just had an idea that if we we're going to be at home for three or four months, not knowing how long we we're going to be at home, is so my kids obviously don't end up just watching telly all day and not having any kind of routine, is that we'd shoot some stuff in the garden. So I contacted my friends, if I build some green screen, some little sets, would you mind just adding some visual effects just to make my kids have something that when they go back to school, whenever it is, that they've done something during the holiday. So the first thing we did was some zombie stuff. And when I looked at it, I thought, even though it doesn't cut to the stuff that we did, could we involve this in somehow? So the idea was basically it's a day in the life of Judge Dredd taking certain stories from certain comics, you know, and, the, and, and, and sort of, you know, the graphic novels and making it like, like 24 of the series, a day in the life of Judge Dredd. And that's what we've ended up with, which is basically the story is not great because it goes all over the place, but it's something that I've put together with friends and family, lots of help from lots of friends that love what we were doing. Um, and it's nearly finished. Mm -hmm. Ironically, when we came out of lockdown, you would think, you know, the industry then went, was booming. So I haven't stopped, luckily, and a lot of my colleagues until literally this Christmas, uh, until the strikes happened, obviously, with, you know, the United States. Um, so it's taken nearly four years only because we've had other things, you know, and people aren't available. Then my lead, who was playing Judge Dredd, who was one of Bond's doubles, uh, Gordon Alexander, he wasn't available. But now, obviously, I've been editing for the last two months. I nearly have a locked, you know, edit. Just have a few things to insert. And then it's the rest is what the visual effects are left. So the idea about it is just to put it out there mm. as a fan film, but to show what you can do with a bit of you know, goodwill and friends and not with a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, 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 it, for what it is, it looks great. I think we've, we had a lot of fun making this. Mm. Um, ironically, when we came out of lockdown, I didn't want to go back to work. I wanted just to carry on doing it. I turned my house into, into a fully full production, building <laughs> sets in my garden. And my neighbors who obviously couldn't leave during the lockdown loved what we were doing because obviously they were watching out their window, but you know, <laughs> in theory, making a film, but it was good fun. Um, so I'm trying to do a making of as well. Apart from obviously the actual short, which the short will probably run about 25 minutes, maybe a little bit shorter. Um, but yeah, and I've had loads of people involved and we shot over a period of four years and hopefully, you know, people will like it when we release it, knowing the story behind it, obviously that it was shot mainly, mm -hmm. most of it during lockdown. So does it mean that the next thing for you uh, is directing? I'd love to direct. I mean, I love, I love working in films. I love, I love creating. And one thing, obviously, which, you know, it's, it's that I started making films 
when I was 12 years old on my dad's Super 8 camera. Mm. Technology wasn't like it is, you know, domestic video cameras didn't exist. Tutorials online, because the internet didn't exist. So there was only a couple of, there was one magazine called Movie Maker and a program on British television called Screen Test, where they used to have the Young Filmmakers Competition of the Year. But apart from that, there was no, I was making stuff with my Star Wars models, setting them on fire, my train set, inventing stuff. Not that it was great. And back then, to shoot on a cine camera, you could buy an, uh, a three minute reel. Mm-hmm. Eight, it was shooting on six, on, 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 I was going to say on eight mil, uh, three minutes long. And you had to take it to Boots or it was to WH Smith to get it developed. You'd get it back and plug in your projector at 18 frames. And that was, that was proper wet cutting and editing, you know, on little editing. Um, and that's when my fascination for films. Mm. So cut to now where I am now. Yeah, technology. I mean, you can do, you know, on your home computer, you can add effects. I mean, basically, we've done all this in the confines of my garden, my friend's garden, a shopping centre, my trailer. So it's amazing what you can do mm-hmm. um, because the technology exists, whereas back then it would have been impossible. So, yeah, if I can, you know, from this get a project to direct, it'd be amazing. Mm. Do you want people to start sending you scripts, for example? Uh, it's kind of funny. It's, it's, it's not, not so much another string to my bow. It's just I love creating. And mm. when you action direct, or even, even as a stunt coordinator, even though you're not credited as the director, you are directing the stunts because if it's you that's choreographed it, the beats that come in there where someone's had to, you know, either be limping because they've been shot or hitting across the knee, you know, you're direct, even though you've got the director there. So it's just a progression from there. But I have been approached, there's a few projects that I've been attached to direct over the last three years, but unfortunately they've not come through. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but yeah, I, I do get sent scripts, but I'm yet to do my first official film directing. Mm-hmm. I suppose the idea with, um, with my short, um, it's just to show what you can do, you know, uh, mm. with limited, more well, with no budget really, but um, it's not to say that's how I want to shoot films, but it just shows you that with the right creative team and, you know, with people that obviously have the same kind of insight, high sight, like, you know, that want to achieve something, you can perform and, you know, produce something that's pretty good. Mm. Um, so what can you do when you do have a budget? But I have been sent scripts in the last probably two years. Um, I've been approached uh, and I came very close to directing a feature film with a load of the 80s action actors, um, people like Cynthia Rothrock, Richard Norton, um, Don the Dragon Wilson, mm-hmm. uh, Matthias House, loads of actors, but unfortunately uh, it didn't work out. Um, but yeah, that's that's the route. I just want to make films, you know, and, and be around like-minded creative people. You know, it's a great industry to, to be in. You know, I don't like the real world. The thing about films is that you can write your own narrative, you know, you can be the hero. You know, and you can write it, you know. Uh, for me, it's about escapism. You know, mm. other people have, might have different reasons. You know, I'm not there to change the world. For me, cinema is about escapism and, you know, and being entertained. Um, I agree. And just sometimes just forget about all of that. That's the thing. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it's unfortunately, like I said, you know, you can't, life is life. But like I said, is that for, the, for, a, for a brief moment, regardless if you're watching a show on, on a streaming platform or at the cinema, you put everything behind you, you know, mm. and you are for that moment, the hero and, yeah. you know, whatever you've got going in your life, you're kind of, you know, you're cheering for the hero and, you know, you want, or, you know, but again, as, as someone that, that's, that likes performing, it's, it's to play characters that you would not normally, you know, if you're playing a baddie, it's, mm. it's that darker side of you where you're kind of, mm, mm. how can I play this? Mm. You know, it's fun. It's pantomime, you know, it's telling stories. So when you direct, do you think you would necessarily direct an uh, action film or it's not about that? I mean, obviously, horror, action. I mean, I'm a genre fan. Mm-hmm. Could be a thriller, can be a horror film, an adventure film, a war film. Um, but obviously, the narrative, the, the storylines is very important, you know, which mm-hmm. obviously at the end of the day, otherwise, it's just like doing a showreel. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, to me, it doesn't really matter. Even if my first film was a drama without any action, it would be fine. I hope it happens soon. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> All right. You know what? I think we uh, will have blitz round. Quick questions, quick okay. answers. Yeah. Texting or talking? Talking. Cats or dogs? Dogs. You have two, two dogs. Two dogs. Uh, do you have any nicknames? Paco and Paella Pete. Mm-hmm. What dish do you cook best? Chorizo pasta. All right. Your favorite character in any fictional story, book, screen, game? 
Judge Dredd, James Bond, mm. uh, The Man With No Name, Clint Eastwood. Do you play video games? I do. Which ones are, are, are your... Uh, action. Yeah. Did you play Cyberpunk 2077? Yes, I did. How, what do you think about it? It's a great, I'd love to make a film like that. I mean, or Borderlands. Cyberpunk 2077 is my favorite game of all time. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you know that actually they're planning to do a live action uh, film or series. Well, Borderlands has been done, which is a friend of mine, Chris yeah. Stunt, coordinated that. But Call of Duty, I mean, any of those games. Yeah. You know. All right, uh, but back back to <laughs> Blitz Round. Otherwise, we'll spend another hour talking about video games. <laughs> uh, Star Wars or The Lord of the Rings? Star Wars. Which trilogy? The original, what from New think? Hope to Return. Uh, and then after that, I would say Rogue One, Han Solo. You worked on Solo. I did, yes. How was, like was it? it? Again, I was like a, being a kid again. <laughs> <laughs> to be running around, I actually doubled um, one of the actors on it. Unfortunately, the sequence was cut out. Oh. Uh, it suddenly made it into the special features, but we did this uh, battle on this Mimbanese planet, and it was great wearing these prosthetic masks and stuff, and being on wires and mm. getting shot. It was, it was amazing. It was, uh, yeah, it was, mm. I was a kid again. Alien or aliens? Aliens. Uh, when was the last time you cried? Probably when my dad died. How can people reach you if they want to work with you? Uh, well, if they want to be stuntmen, they've got to go through the BSR and become members. And if they want to hire you to be a stunt coordinator? Oh, then, I could, then yes, yes, I'm open to all offers. Um, no, they can either contact me if you have my uh, email, which is peter at stunts for real, mm -hmm. or they can contact me via Instagram, which is pilot Pete. You'll have it all here. All right, and one last thing is a one cool thing, something that you really like that you think our viewers would like to. I would say if they want to follow their dream, then... Regardless of what it is, actor, stuntman, just follow your dream. But after reading this book, which I read many, many moons ago, which is, for most filmmakers, I know, Rebel Without a Crew, Robert Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. When you read that, if that doesn't inspire you to become a filmmaker, in whatever aspect, um, then nothing will. Because mm -hmm. when you read his story to where he is now and what he's achieved, um, it can show you that you know anyone can achieve anything with hard work. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, obviously, with anything in life, right place, right time, knowing the right people. But... If you put the effort in, cream always rises to the top. So, mm. you know. Well, I think uh, I think there is a lot of uh, speculations about film industry. That, like it's all about like who you know. It's all about like how, if you were lucky or not. But I don't think it's true. I think I think yeah, there might be like an element of luck sometimes because maybe you were in the right place in the right time. But to be in that place in that time, you had to put a lot of work into it to get to this place because it's like I, I think all, all the stories about like the sudden success because someone's lucky I, I don't think it's true <laughs> it can I guess it can happen I mean you know people have been spotted on the street you know mm. because if it's for modeling or that someone just stood out but ability you know it's about making an impression mm. you know uh, an ability mm. at the end of the, you know it's, it's you can only give it a go at the end of the day it's better to partake then kind of look back and think, oh, I could have done that. Give yeah. it a go. And at the end of the day, it's, I think most people, especially nowadays with the technology and how you can find out about everything is much more available for people to succeed than it used to be back when I started. Yeah, you know? yeah but you still have to put work into it. Absolutely. I mean, anything that you want obviously takes time. time. Yeah. You know, you have to invest into it. Yeah. So read the book. Definitely, there a, good, is definitely a good read. Definitely a good read. Read the book, put in the effort and... Well, see you next time. Thank you very much.